Well, it's just about that time of the year again. The Ready to Run Sales, the Emperor's Palace Ready to Run Cup on the first Saturday of November at Turfentine. And as James promised, joining me in the studio is none other than our champion breeder, Mick Goss. Mick, welcome to the studio. Nice to have you with us. Okay, it's, it's been a long time be coming. Thank you. If you live far away and it's not easy to get you to Durban. Uh, but let's go back to, to the beginning. We're going to be chatting mostly about the ready-to-run cell and the ready-to-run gallops, the preparation, the farm, etc. This year on the 14th of October, you hosted uh, the luncheon again, the gallops, and it was the 10th anniversary of the ready-to-run gallops in your farm. It seems unbelievable that a decade has already gone by. But it's amazing how from an organizational point of view, from a preparedness point of view, how far we've come since those early days. Graham, I think ready to runs around the world have come a very, very long way in the last couple of years, and we've all borrowed from one another. New Zealand have been very helpful with us. Um, they were the third country to start. We were the second, as you know. Um, America was first. But uh, the sales are evolving very quickly, and of course, I've got a great team there who do a post-mortem after every lot of gallops, and we try and work out a year in advance what we're going to do for next year, what we need to do for next year. And then we've got to get all the stakeholders to buy into it as well. So it's not a, a unilateral thing, but having it on the farm, of course, does give us some latitudes. Well, you've been a great promoter here in South Africa, possibly the only real promoter from a breeder's perspective of the ready to run concept. But it did start in South Africa sometime earlier. Chris Smith, I think, uh, of Chris Smith Bloodstock, the late Chris Smith, was the first to conduct a ready to run sale. In fact, I recall some some of those gallops on the infield at Gosworth Park with horses going in every direction but the right direction. Yeah. But uh, it was fun in those days, but it's become very professional now. And uh, I was there on the 14th of October, and one of the things that I've noticed is the improvement in the quality of rider that you're using. And I think you can be very proud of the fact that they are mostly homegrown riders, and it's all part of your, your transformation initiative. Some of these guys have even been to America. Of course. Can I just tell you how this thing originated? Because I think it has a very um, interesting history. Uh, I was at dinner in Florida one evening, and Chris Smith happened to be there with the O'Farrell family. And now, the late Joe O'Farrell, in 1957, as long ago as that, and this was 87, so it was 30 years later, had started ready to run sales in Florida because he would found difficulty in selling his horses against the top breeders in Kentucky. And we were experiencing the same thing. We were little known here. We were finding it difficult to move our horses against the top farms. So we decided we'd wrap our product up differently as well, and we mimicked them. And Chris happened to be there, and we decided we'd run the sale. As long ago as 1987. So this year was like the 24th or the 25th set of gallops, and of course, the 25th staging of the sale. Um, but remembering those days, do you remember the bee year when we only ran a third of the, of the catalogue and the bees got loose and we, we had to abandon the gallops? Uh, another time, I remember Imperial Dispatch taking off. He became champion two-year-old, unbeaten as a two-year-old. The only guy that could pick him up as a galloper was Michael Azzi because he had his own boy on top. And, and of course, he topped the sale at 65,000 and went on to start him. So from those little beginnings at Gosforth Park, the sale has got to where it is today. And I think. South Africa can take a bow. We're running as professional a set of sales, according to Kip Elsa, who was here from America the other day, uh, as professional a set of sales as anywhere in the world, including in the United States, where they gallop on proper race courses and so on. As far as the transformation uh, thing is concerned, I sent a couple of my management over. We've just completed our 40th international scholarship for our Zulus this year, since starting this program 15 years ago. But more, more recently, the last seven or eight years, we've been sending fellows to the United States to a great lady called Becky Thomas, who takes them in as her own and looks after them that way. But I started out sending people like Kerry originally, then Taryn to America, and uh, that girl Jessica used to ride for us. They all went out there and they rode for Becky at the highest level at these gallops and came back with stories about how they thought we should progress this thing. And then we decided it was time for, to send our, our, our riders out who are all members of the previously disadvantaged community, as you know. And um, it's been a wonderful learning experience for them, just as our other scholarships to Ireland, England, and, of course, to the old Gainsborough farm when Jake McDoom was still alive. Um, they've been out there to, to experience life on the other side of the world. 
Yeah, and as part of the formalities, I'm sure it's a big moment for them uh, before the gallops actually get underway on the farm. You introduce all of the riders to uh, to those in attendance, and they get gifts from Bob Urim, uh, the CEO of Empress Palace. And for them, it's obviously a big occasion, the Ready to Run gallops. There's a chance for them to show uh, off their skills. Uh, apart from the riders, obviously, just very briefly, we digress a second. Uh, just a year or so ago, you opened up the School of Excellence uh, on the farm. The two things are in parallel. I mean, our riding academy is, is not part of the School of Excellence, but they're all part of this process. I mean, we there was no inheritance at Summer Hill, as you know. We've had to do things differently, get up a little earlier in the mornings just to, to enable us to compete. And one of the areas that we reckon we could really get involved with, our, an area that we had some control over, was to teach our people to be the very best they could be. And amazingly, and I've said this so often to people, but I, it needs to be said publicly, the Zulus and many of our local people are some of the most gifted stockmen in the world. They're some of the finest horsemen ever created. They have wonderful hands and a wonderful empathy with animals. Um, you often see people uh, controlling animals by, by brute force. I've never seen a Zulu abuse a horse and I've never seen a horse abuse a Zulu. So the School of Excellence is an extension of that. It's the only school of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere which offers the course that we do in equine management and we've had a wonderful opening year as you know and our subscriptions for next year include a number of kids now from the advantaged community uh, honors students six a's in a trick don't be intimidated we've got kids who are just normal kids as well um, because you don't have to be a smart student to be a great horseman you just have to attend the school and have the natural love of the game now, having said that the whole ready to run concept has come such a long way, as you said, it goes way back to the 80s and now a very professionally run operation. But at the same time, one of your key phrases has been, we, we, we want to have fun with this thing. And obviously, uh, a very clever marketing move, but also obviously to have a bit of fun and in, to introduce a bit of excitement and competition into to the set itself, the race was born and in fact was run for half a million rand stake. I, I did say earlier a million, but in fact the first race was run for a half a million stake. Back in 2007 when Mark Dixon Zumgazi won it, uh, the race has now become obviously, uh, the Empress Palace Ready to Run Cup has obviously become an integral part of the whole promotion. Yeah, well, critically, I mean, you can always have fun winning two million rand. We all know that. And uh, it's part of our, our, our advertising program this year, as you know, uh, pulling the legs of people who say anyone who ever said that you couldn't have that money couldn't buy you happiness just look at the faces of the people who won the race but the reality is that um, money was the one thing and I think in any situation like this making it the joint third richest race in the country was going to bring some prominence to the race but you know in the old days people raced for the trophy and we said you know we've got to bring back the trophies to the game as well so we went and we scoured the cupboards the trophy cabinets of the race courses of the country and we found we dug up in the old Mosenthal Museum at Turfentine this dusty trophy, this magnificent trophy given by King George V's sister to uh, the Johannesburg Turf Club in 1922 and of course they've been visitors at Summerhill so it was entirely appropriate and we've pulled that out and had it redone and it is now the greatest trophy in the game. But do you remember the old days when people, horses that ran in the July all went to the Gold Cup? because of that great gold trophy. There were nine of them left in and these And still results. today, the trophy that we give away for the Gold Cup is valued at around 12 to 15,000 Rand. And that's the one we give away. I'm yeah. not talking about the floating trophy. Exactly. I'll try buying one. I, I had to go to 60,000 to buy a 1945 Gold Cup that was won by our... Well, trophies, trophies uh, bear witness to the history of the race, don't of course, they? Of course. That's, that's yeah. the important thing. Well, in 2007, of course, a 180,000 Rand uh, graduate of the Salem Ghazi won it. In 2008, uh, a 100,000 Rand graduate, uh, Smangaliso from the Mike Miller stable, then a 60,000 Rand purchase that seemed to be going down in value. Pierre Jordan won in 2009, and then of course Hollywood Boulevard, she was an expensive filly at 900,000. But an interesting statistic to come out of the race is the score line. It's Colts 2, Phillies 2, KwaZulu Natal 2, Highfelt 2. Interestingly, this year, uh, for the 2011 renewal of the race, Dean Kanemeyer is committed to coming up in an attempt to put the Western Cape on the board. He's bringing a pretty useful sort who could be competitive. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a race for the, for, the, for the rich and the not so rich. It's a race for the Colts and the Phillies. And whether you're on the high felt or elsewhere, you have a chance of grabbing the first take. Exactly. And that's why we gave the Western Cape a trial this year. I mean, there are five trials before the races, you know, to ensure that people get a chance to 
to um, qualify. Dean was already over the line, it looks like, anyway, at that point. Uh, he looks pretty much a shoe in to get into the race. But, you know, he's won Group 1 races from Cape Town uh, up to a mile, so there's no free my heart. There's absolutely no reason why he can't go and repeat this. Joey Ramston's done the same in the past. And I think uh, it's, well, it's all in the mind, this business of not being able to win it. Well, we saw, we saw Mike Bass win a Group 1 in the Highfield this year with exactly. English Garden. So yeah. this year, the race promises to be truly representative of the entire country, which must really fill you with a, a, a lot of joy. Absolutely, Graham. And you know, what, what is really encouraging to me is to see what they call the big five studs down in Cape Town. Uh, your sponsor, Drakenstein, Main Chance Highlands, Clava Flay, and I believe Mary's got a couple in the, in the sale as well, or at least one in the sale, coming to the party because it makes the sale more inclusive and it makes it more competitive. You can't really have a lot of fun doing things all in your own because it makes it very pressured. So to have a partner like Empress Palace, to have any sponsors, of course, essential, but to have a sponsor that is so willing and so passionate about racing uh, as Bob Urim is um, at Empress Palace, I mean, that, that just completes the circle. I can't say enough about the man. He's a hell of a man. He's a very rare human being. But he surrounded himself, and that's the mark of the man, with some spectacular people. He's got a team of people there who are as dedicated as professionals as any people I've ever worked with in my life. And that's saying something, because I've worked with some wonderful people, but as a collective, they're an outstanding team of people. And uh, they bring so much to the table. We've learned an awful lot from them, I must tell you. And, and they, they, because of what we've learned, other countries around the world have learned about cooperating with, with a sponsor like, like uh, Empress Palace. Um, Kip Elsa was just saying the other day that this whole package was probably standalone in the world. Um, and I think that's a wonderful statement coming from an American where they pioneered the concept. Well, Empress Pellets obviously uh, big partners with, with Bloodstock South Africa in terms of the national yearling cell, the national two-year-old cell, now the ready-to-run cell. And of course, uh, also partnering on the big day with Pumalela Gaming and Leisure Limited, or the hosts on the afternoon, uh, they've also got involved in the charity mile. So the race day has now become a huge event. You've got the Empress Palace Ready to Run Cup, and uh, that uh, is run on the same day as the charity mile, along with all the pizzazz of, of, of a half a million ran up for grabs for the charities, the celebrities. Also on the day, of course, uh, quite, uh, quite importantly, is the Grand Beck Stakes, the Starling Stakes. These are three-year-old races, as as is the Empress Palace Ready to Run Cup, all pointing towards the classics. So obviously your focus is on the Empress Palace Ready to Run Cup and the sale the following day. But it's become a huge event. The, the cocktail party on the Friday night, the gallops beforehand, both in Johannesburg and on your farm, uh, the charity mile supported by Empress Palace. Wonderful to be a part of such an occasion. It's a festival, and it starts with the gallops, as you know. And we say to people, come to Joburg for the week. Come and enjoy it. There's, there's, you know, there's all sorts of things going on, and we actually put out with our brochure and on our website the selection of the top 10 restaurants in Joburg in any one year. We get our chef, who, as you know, is a celebrity chef in her own right, uh, Jackie Cameron. She selects what she would say are the 10 restaurants she'd like to go to if she's spending a week in Joburg. And uh, so all, it's a package. And then there's the shuttle from... The, the, the hotel to the races, the hotel to the sales grounds. It's, there's a wonderful at, uh, festival atmosphere on the sales grounds. And gratifyingly, people are starting to take advantage of it. And of course, it's part of the sponsorship package that we are able to put these people up at Emperor's. And so the whole thing, we're all together in the swim. It is. It's just a great week. Now, we've already mentioned that the stake has gone from 500,000 in 2007 and has grown rapidly to 2 million in 2011. And in a scenario where stakes over the last couple of years have stagnated as a result of, uh, of all that is happening around us in the world, 2012, already talk of maybe 2.5 million? Well, it can happen. Uh, uh, and if you do the arithmetic, it's not difficult to explain. We've slightly enlarged the subscription for the sale to 185 entries. There'll probably be 170 through the ring. But if you, if you multiply that by eight, which is the breeders' subscription, and by the way, it's inverted as against other sales races around the world, the breeders are putting in here nearly a, a million and a half towards the stake. Uh, if, if everybody who buys a horse subscribes that horse for 4,000 Rand, and let's face it, when you've paid 60,000 even for a horse, it's not a hell of a lot to pay. 
the horses deserve the two million. Let me just say that. Um, I think the record tells us that. So we felt it was an investment that was well worth making. But, and so, so do the customers, obviously. But critically, um, if you do the arithmetic and we talk a little bit to the sponsors and the, and, and the other stakeholders like Pumalela and, and BSA, I don't have any doubt that we could get to 2.5 million next year. So when we talk about next year's race, we're obviously talking about the horses which are about to be sold at the ready to run sale on the 6th of November. The, the horses being sold this year could conceivably con uh, compete for two and a half million next year. Exactly. And it will take the race to joint second. Well, I think the, the point that you've made is for somebody not to tick the box buying at the, at the ready to run sale smacks of craziness for me because, I mean, one of the great advantages of the sale is you have such a richly endowed uh, restricted race that you can, that you can aim at and and obviously because it is a restricted race it hasn't been granted listed or black type status but as you've just said there can be no denying quite apart from the fact that Igugu and Pierre Jordan both graduates of the sale ran first and second in the Vodacom Durban July you can't there's huge depth uh, to the graduates that have come out of the sale and out of the race well let's not forget in the last three years, there have been four Guineas winners. Imbongi won the Gauteng Colts Guineas. Fasani won the Phillies Guineas the same day as Pierre Jordan won the Colts Guineas. And then last year, uh, Igugu won the Gauteng Phillies Guineas. So four Guineas winners in three years is quite a staggering outcome. On top of that, the top earner for this last year, Igugu in South Africa. The top earner last year, Pierre Jordan. And who would have ticked the box for him at 60,000? Or for Imbongi, for that matter, at, at no bid the previous year? Or Sitela this last year, tragically uh, killed on the, on the gallops the other day, but here's a horse who, who couldn't get 50,000 last year. Um, and then here the drums at 42,000 became the winning most race horse in South Africa. So who would have ticked those boxes? Tick a box. It's as simple as that. At 40,000, you most, the Alexanders buy 10 or 15 horses in the sale every year. They tick the box for everyone. Well, I'm sure you have to tick the box if you're going to have the belief to buy the horse and you've got this carrot dangling uh, in a year's time, you, you've got to tick the box. Uh, this, by definition, the race and the sale has been dominated by, by Summer Hill Stud. It, it is your promotion. It is a Summer Hill promotion in, in cooperation with, of course, Empress Palace's sponsor, Pumalela, the, who staged the event. But, but clearly, with the race having grown, a lot more people are, are sitting up and taking notice, and more and more other vendors are coming on board, and obviously there were gallops at Turfentine on the 12th of October. Uh, you obviously welcome the competition. Well, clearly, we've encouraged people to, to come to the sale because we think this could be the most important or the most significant ready-to-run sale in the world, and it's, it's moving quickly in that direction. There are 25 foreign-bred horses in the sale this year. That's the biggest subscription of foreign-bred horses in any sale in South African history. Let, and they're not all yours. Not, fact, at all. Uh, not at all. It's about 50-50, in fact. Uh, no, it's a little bit more in favour of, of, of our draft, but it doesn't matter because not all of them belong to us. Let me put it that way around. And in fact, only less than half of them do we hold an interest in. So, yes, there is a, a subscription among other people who've asked us to consign, and that number will go up and down depending on the exchange rate, depending on the success of the horses, etc., etc. But I think what's important here is just about every major sire in the country is represented in the sale, and a lot of the major studs have come to the party. And um, the outcome is not what matters to us in terms of whether we win it or not. It's always nice to win it. Uh, nobody ever said coming second was, was what we were looking to do in life. But the reality is the more good farms, the more good uh, subscriptions we have, top class subscriptions we have, the better the sale will get. Now, obviously, the sale takes place on, on Sunday, the 6th of November. I've got the catalogue with us. Uh, we'll show it to you just in a moment. Uh, but it's on Sunday, the 6th of November. Here's your catalogue. If you haven't got it, it's the Empress Palace uh, ready to run sale. If you'd like to zoom in, uh, we'll show off the catalogue, the front page. It starts at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so everybody can get to the TBA Sales Complex Gosforth Park, spend the weekend at the magnificent Doriel Grand Hotel, which is one of three or four hotels uh, that Empress Palace own on the property right next door to the OR Tambo Airport. Um, you have a very special Summer Hill payment plan to assist. We've seen, in fact, uh, of the four past winners, uh, one at 180, one at 100, one at 60, three South African bred, one, one foreign winner, two Colts, two Phillies, two from KZN, two from the Highfelt. Uh, but you there, this is the sale that is billed as there's something for everyone. 
uh, from a lower price to a higher price and ultimately the racetrack will be the test of who, who has actually been most astute either in judging the gallops and, and we know that you do have a panel of judges um, who sometimes get it right and sometimes get it wrong but uh, at the end of the day each has got to buy what they like and you have a very special payment plan to assist them. Graham, uh, it kicks in at 60,000, you get three checks at 60,000, this has been going now for 12 or 13 years, um, it's gone from three checks to six instalments at the top end, uh, at 100,000 you get four checks, at 150 it's five checks, at 200,000 and beyond, in aggregate purchases by the way, not per purchase, you get to six checks, which is a top end of about 33,000 a month. But at the bottom end, at 60,000, you could buy yourself a Pierre Jordan on, on, on three checks at 20,000 a month. That brings it within the range of affordability of a hell of a lot bigger bench of people who are able to attend and participate and buy themselves a dream. Um, critically, it comes without interest, um, unless you default, of course. Um, you'd only have to be in good standing with uh, Bloodstock South Africa to qualify for the terms. and. Uh, it's our great pleasure, you know, Marcus Eusta taught me this. I said to him, how did you grow your business the way you did, as quickly as you have? He said, sensible credit. And I must say this, um, by and large, we collect our money at the ready to run just about as quickly as we get our money at the national sale. So um, it's our great pleasure to do this. I think it's been fundamental to the growth of the sale. And uh, of course, if you want to run your horse any sooner, you take a Fanyana who was sold on Sunday and two Thursdays later he was in the winner's enclosure by three and a half lengths, you need to pay. Then you must have paid. Dear Bill, so no change of ownerships are issued until, until all of the payment has been made uh, to either Samuel or to Bloodstock South Africa. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think that makes common sense. The gallops are obviously vital in terms of the promotion of the Ready to Run sale, and not everybody gets to see the gallops live. You always put on a wonderful spread on the farm. We generally have four to 500 people there. Uh, the gallops at, uh, on the Highfeld took place at Turfentine. I believe they went off extremely well. I yeah. haven't seen evidence of them yet, but Caroline Simpson, who obviously arranged those gallops at Turfentine again with the blessing of Pumalela. Uh, these were prepared by Highfeld-based trainers and they really went through their paces well. Uh, and obviously there weren't too many people there to watch it live. So we all rely to some extent on being able to watch these gallops over and over again, either on the websites or uh, by obtaining a DVD. Now, what is the situation? Uh, the websites, DVDs, what's, what's available to prospective buyers to, to actually go through them very carefully? Catalogs are being posted with DVDs. So you, you get the DVD option, obviously, when you get your catalog. But if you want to see them on the website, you just go into our website, for example, and you can click on the gallops and you'll get them straight up. And, uh, um, and the same on BSA, I would imagine. Of course, exactly. Well, in fact, the link is to BSA. And um, the, other, the other way you would do it is to watch Teletrack because they'll be on the loop on Teletrack, uh, which is great fun of an evening. You just watch the well, loop. Some racing ends, it's generally 12 o'clock. Yeah, well, of course, <laughs> but there are early mornings as well. So you can pick it up and you could sit there with your catalog and get through them. Um, it's a great, listen, there is no greater way of picking a horse. I think that's why Ready to Runs have become so popular around the world. I was at the Kentucky Derby this year, 11 of the 18 in the field were graduates of a breeze up sale. And it's, it's, it's growing in popularity. But we are in the running business. And if you can see a horse run, that's about 16 out of 20. I guess, for me anyway, picking a horse walking up and down is 10 out of 20. This is a wonderful advantage. And the other thing, which is so attractive, is that if you buy a horse in November, you save keep from January or March or whatever the case may be all the way to November, can be as much as 60 to 80,000 on the cost of a horse. That could be the whole cost of a horse um, that you've saved in keep charges by buying as late as you do. And if I may say so, um, certainly for the horses I saw at Summerhill galloping the other day, and I speak now for the other vendors at the sale as well, those horses were beautifully schooled, and that's why the gallops went as well as they did. Seven, eight years ago, you remember, they, they either ran behind the grandstand. Well, we put 180 odd horses through their paces in, in, in a couple of hours, yep. and, and with lunch thrown in, it was, a, it was a very, very pleasant afternoon, and the weather played ball this year. Exactly. It has been bitterly cold or wet or both in past years, but this year was a glorious day. In fact, it got burnt. Uh, yes, I must agree with you. The, the other vendors who brought horses to, to your gallops, also they also went through their paces very, very well. Innovation is, um, is a characteristic, it's a trademark of Mick Goss and, and the way he does things. And this has led you to writing new records in other spheres, seven consecutive Breeders' Championships, 
Uh, you've always been a team player, but it's obviously getting harder and harder. That in itself is a South African record, seven in a row from one single breeder. But uh, you are obviously mindful that the competition is hotting up. It's bloody hot in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, you, you know, it's like the Microsoft playbook. You only get so much of a lead and then they lock onto your taillights. You've got to veer off in another direction. But Graham, I, I, I'm uh, comforted to a large degree by the fact that you've got to identify other things in life that uh, will charm you, that will please you. Um, our team are ready for the day that we don't win the championship. We've, we've, we've locked onto education now. We've locked onto new ways of doing things. We've locked onto new genetic uh, approaches to how we're breeding horses. And we hope those things will give us the other 5% here and there that will keep us in the, in the, in the swing anyway. Um, there are big juggernauts coming at us every day. Um, not the least of which the farms I've just mentioned, they're all there we're having wonderful seasons. But you know, I think one of the keys, and Summerhill is a genuine example of this, there's no false modesty in what I'm telling you. I have hardly picked any of the people on my team. They have assembled themselves, they have motivated themselves. It's easy to get out of bed to go and work with people like the people I go to work with. and. Um, they come up every day with new ideas and it's they're young people with lots of energy and they're the elderly not quite as old as i am but uh, approaching my distance uh, who are imbued with lots of wisdom and experience and the combination of the two uh, energizes us all it keeps us in the swing and um, yeah we'll come up with other things uh, i don't know about how far you could i don't know how how much more innovation you can throw into a ready to run sale <laughs> but uh, there'll be new things in you'll find there. something mick you'll find something we want to say thank you very much for making the trip up from the dustiest little town <laughs> uh, farm town you, you always sort of talk about you, you breed on the dustiest little town how do you describe it i think we're the dustiest little dorp uh, 10 kilometers outside the dustiest little dorp at the southernmost tip of what the civilized world called the darkest continent. <laughs> that, I, I, was, I, I really wanted to try and memorize all that, but I couldn't because uh, it is, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's, it's far better than you said. Mick, yeah. thank you very much for being on the show. We trust that the sale goes extremely well, that the race day goes off well. A small token of our appreciation from our sponsors in Tibet. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at Turfentine on Saturday, the 5th of November for the Empress Palace Ready to Run Cup and, of course, the Empress Palace Charity Mile and all those wonderful supporting features at the cocktail party at Empress Palace on the Friday evening before all this happens. And most importantly, on Sunday afternoon at the TBA Sales com Complex, Sunday, the 6th of November, the sale gets underway at 2 o'clock. One last question before you go. When do the horses actually arrive at the complex for general viewing? Well, ours is a three-day operation, as you can imagine. I think we've got 118 going up. So we start, I think, on Thursday or Friday, and we go right through to Saturday. They should be settle, settling in on Sunday. So I guess Monday right through... So a full week. week. Yeah, yeah. So there you have it, a full week of viewing at your leisure from the Monday preceding uh, the sales weekend. So that's from the last Monday of October, which I believe is the 31st of October. Thank you for joining us. We're going to play out with a very special insert produced by Andrew Bon all about the 2011 ready-to-run sale.